you for tuning in to another edition of Taz Talks. Today I am joined by Chris Packham. I'm sure you will all know him. I'm sure you're all massive fans. Just in case you don't, Chris, can I just ask you to tell all our viewers a little bit about you, who you are, what you stand for? Oh, goodness, that's quite a broad, um, broad challenge you've set me. So, my, well, my name is Chris Packham. I'm 59 years old. I was born in the UK. I'm a naturalist, trained as a zoologist. And since the mid-80s, I've been working in television, making natural history programmes. Outside of that, I take photographs and paint. I've always had a sort of a, an irrepressible urge to create things independently of teamwork. Um, I've written a few books and I'm an ardent campaigner uh, for the environment and for the species that try to, to live in it alongside us. And I probably spend about 50% of my time now campaigning and the other 50% entertaining what I'm told is a portfolio career, writing, photography, TV, it's that and the other. Portfolio career, so a posh way of saying you do the stuff you really love. Um, not always, because I end up, you know, in the same predicament as anyone else, not at this point in time. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm on the train, I'm on the motorway. I, I, the, the mundane day-to-day -day, uh, uh, facts of life are, are there. And quite a lot of my time is given over to travelling. Um, I'm hoping that when we get to our new normal uh, after the corona crisis, I won't be spending so much time travelling because we'll be doing things as we are today, um, remotely. Yeah just as effectively, far more environmentally friendly and far more efficiently uh, and in terms of our own health and well-being. Um, if I can do things here in the comfort of my own home and save myself a, an otherwise often torturous journey, then I'm going to be mentally and physically a lot happier. So let's hope that we learn some lessons from this catastrophe and make sure that in the future what we do is far more sustainable on so many different levels. Absolutely. That's got to be one of the good things about this, hasn't it? Do you think that with your work, I mean, will it be possible with TV to do things remotely? How, how do you think it might be able to benefit us all afterwards? One of the things my mother used to say, and she would say quite a lot, uh, was that you've got to see some good in any bad. And, and this is very, very bad. So we've got to find some real good in it. And I think that we should all be thinking now, um, under this you know, terrible oppression that, we, that we've got, um, how on the other side we can live healthier lives as a species and, and as individuals. And in terms of TV, well, every morning for the last, I don't know, uh, let's think, eight, six weeks, my stepdaughter and I, I've gone into the garden and using two mobile phones and a, a very adept colleague in his bedroom in Norwich, we have been producing a live TV program of sorts, a broadcast, which we're putting out on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. And we're attracting sometimes an audience of half a million people. And two of us are, are putting it together. Um, and Fabian is running the technical side. Uh, we have a lady dealing with admin. Um, I, I'm not saying it's, it's BAFTA winning television. It, it's, it's, it really is sort of Heath Robinson, you know, back of the, you know, as my dad would say, back of the fag packet type of uh, approach. But, you know, we're, we're doing something. And I think that media is going to have to learn because what, we've, what we're seeing is that a lot of people are broadcasting and they're, they're putting out some really good stuff and they're becoming increasingly adept at, you know, managing the, the little technology that they have to make it pretty technically good as well. I, I hope there will be a lot of positive changes in response to this episode, which has shown just how vulnerable we are as a species and therefore how vulnerable our whole environment is too. And, and, and there should be some sweeping changes, which will mean that our future in the aftermath should be brighter and more secure. What are the first steps you would like to see those in power, whatever that means now, take after this? What, what would you like to see government changing internationally? What would you like to see changing? I think, first of all, you know, we need a, a you know, we, we need an appraisal of, of how we've dealt with it, you know, and, and how we didn't prepare for it. But, you know, viruses, bacteria, pathogens of any type are part and parcel of the natural environment. And mm -hmm. although we have tried to forget it, we are still part of that natural environment. And pathogens are out there attacking the trees and the flowers and the, 
and the, the fungi in the animals all of the time. And they're attacking us all of the time. If you look at our history, there have been a number of very serious pandemics which have swept through our populations doing devastating harm. But they've always been there for, for a reason. Um, and we've conquered them with advances in medical science. And there were a lot of people who knew that we were living in an overcrowded, very connected world. And that when uh, something like coronavirus uh, arose, we would be vulnerable. But once again, you know, the one thing that I've noted about humanity is that we are very good at cure. We're very intelligent. We're very resourceful. We're very adaptable. Um, we're very good at responding. But, you know, there were a lot of people out there who were, were, were ringing the warning bells. Um, and, and I'm afraid to say we didn't listen. And we should have had the infrastructure and, and, and everything in place to deal with this when it happened. And so the first thing is that it could happen again. Um, and, and therefore, we must make sure that our cupboards are full of PPE and ventilators and whatever other medical tools that we need to combat these sorts of pandemics. Because, you know, the world has changed since we had the bubonic plague and, and, and cholera epidemics. You know, in those days, people were not traveling great distances in very short periods of time en masse. And what we've seen here is the capacity for this virus to spread very rapidly around the world with enormously damaging repercussions. It was entirely predictable, and therefore we should make sure we're in a position to, to deal with it far more effectively next time. I think also, what we will need to do is look at the positive benefits of the way that we've had to change our lives. Because again, I, you know, a few months ago, we, people were saying, well, we can't do that, you know, because it just it's the climate, it's impossible to do it. Well, hold on. When we've really had to, when the problem has been tangible, not ex existential like the climate, we've shown our species, I'm talking about, across the planet has shown that we can take very draconian measures in terms of the way that we live our lives almost instantaneously mm. it's difficult we are suffering as a result but through that suffering we are also inventive and we're coming up with means of overcoming that and making the whole thing more comfortable and and and, and more durable so i think part and part of that reappraisal must be you know, not going back to the old normal. I don't want to go back to congested streets. I don't want to go back to skies full of planes and, and roads full of cars, when yeah. those things can be at least in part alleviated by remote communication, such as that we're engaging in now. You know, I, I, do we, at this point in time, obviously, you know, the trade around the world has very much changed. You know, do we want to continue to import foods from other far flung parts of the planet when we are growing them perfectly well on our own doorstep? There are so many things. There will be so many opportunities. And I hope that there are environmental entrepreneurs out there who will seize upon these opportunities and make sure that we come out of this period of darkness, as I say, into a brighter, lighter, and better world. I really hope that people will listen to that. One, one of the concerns I have is, is I'm seeing lots of people talking about their desire to get back to normal quickly. And for me, like you, I don't want to go back to the way things were. You know, sure, there are, there are things that some of us are missing. People who are isolated on their own, simple things like a hug, they're going to be missing. It's going to be tough if you're on your own. It's tough for people who are isolated with with family members that perhaps don't get on well with there are going to be people who are isolated where there's domestic abuse going on and they're all things that we need to address but the bigger picture is do we really want to go back to that i mean my business has largely gone online and yeah i'm getting eyeball like from so much screen time but conversely i can hear the birds singing a lot more and the planet is starting to show signs of you'll know more than more than I'm hesitant to say recovery, but certainly the planet is starting to show us that if we just step back a little bit, she will provide mm. for us in, in far more beautiful ways. So mm. what, what can we do, if anything, to, to turn this around from this desire, the, the kind of Trump-like desire to get back to the way things were and instead use this as a catalyst to, to do something better? Uh, I, I think that we will have to scream and shout. I think that we are, you know, learning of our 
vulnerability. We're exposing that vulnerability without any ambiguity through the work of scientists. If we think about the climate, you know, there is, there yeah. is no ambiguity about the dangers that our changing climate is, is, is ringing upon the world. Uh, we've seen flooding in Yorkshire. We've seen widespread flooding all over Indonesia. We've seen, you know, catastrophic fires in Australia and California. Um, we, 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 we don't want that. We can't sustain that as a, as a species. So we will have to change. The excuses were in the past, we can't. Well, we've just proved, as I said, that we can. But we are living in a political period where those who are, you know, have embraced the most power have vested interest in the old normal. So I fear that coming out of this, just as Extinction Rebellion uh, and, and all of the youth climate activists were needing to take to the streets to ask for change in, in that regard, we will have to fight, unfortunately, to get these measures put in place. Um, for them, the old system worked. You know, the, the capitalist system of, that's, that's driven by consumption. But we know full well that, you know, prior to Corona, uh, if everyone in the world consumed at the same rate as we consume here in the UK, we would need two extra planets just to keep it going. If we consume at the wow. same rate as people do in North America, we would need four extra planets. That's at, at that point in time. So clearly that consumption model is, 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 is entirely unsustainable. And we need to change the way that we live and the, and the way that we continue to live. Farming needs radical reform. Um, you know, the way that we use food needs radical perform, reform. Uh, in the UK, a third of the food that we actually pay for in, 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 in wherever we get it, um, we waste. A third, one third of the food. So, you know, we will have to change these things. And this is an opportunity. We have to see on the, on the other side of this gruesome uh, episode opportunities to make ourselves more secure because this is it has exposed our vulnerability okay it's through a pathogen it's through a, a virus causing a disease but it's symptomatic of the fact that the way that we were living on the planet was wholly unsustainable um, and, and, but I, I, I fear like you do I mean I, 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 I the most disappointing thing is Yes, people saying we want to get back to normal. Um, and then you go outside and you hear that bird song and you see those bees buzzing and you see the, a healthy environment, which we are dependent on and part of beginning to prosper. And you think, no, no, we don't. We need to get back to a way of life where those people aren't being uh, abused in their homes and where they can hug and where we can entertain a good quality of life. Um, but it needs to be from my perspective, a better quality of life. And that opportunity should be afforded to them. Yeah, yeah. Our, our quality of life shouldn't be at the detriment of the environment. You know, I was, I was talking to someone a few days back who was saying that they changed the way they were, they were interacting with their kids and moved away from, you know, taking them out to a bounty castle. And now the kids are getting interested in what birds, what, what bird is that, mommy? What's making that sound? What kind of tree is that? And, you know, it's, it's easy to hark back to the golden days, but I think we've moved a long way even from, from when I was, was a kid. We had those little I spy books where you could flick through and they encouraged you to look at different elements of wildlife. And now we just want to sit in front of one of these. The simple stuff, isn't this at least encouraging us to get back to the simple stuff? And that's got to be good for, for us as a, as, as a species, as a race, as people, hasn't it? Well, I mean, look, we know that engaging with nature improves our physical and mental health. Now, in the past, that was measured subjectively because we would go out for a walk in the woods, we'd listen to some bird song, watch some butterflies, whatever it happens to be, and we'd come back and we feel better. But this is being quantified now. We, we know through you know, published peer-reviewed scientific research that yeah. you know, being in those natural environments is better for us mentally. Um, it's less stressful. And there were very, you know, when you delve into the science, there's some pretty obvious physiological, neurological reasons for that. Um, we know that certain trees release compounds during the, the summer 
which we can breathe in and they enhance the production of our natural killer cells, part of our immune system that attacks things like viruses and, and, and tumors. Yeah. So that's a, a direct tree to people physiological connection, which is beneficial. We know that our eyes show the greatest sensitivity of their color range in the green yellow part of the spectrum because we essentially evolved in a green yellow world not yeah. a gray concrete world so when we move out of our cityscapes and into more natural landscapes we are essentially more comfortable because we are able to analyze that environment with a, a greater clarity you know there's 50 shades of gray in you know literary terms um, but in fact, the human eye can only discern 30 shades of grey, whereas it can discern millions of different tones of green and yellow. And then when it comes wow. to things like birdsong, um, very often I think it's the simplicity of nature, it's quintessential purity of beauty, which sweeps people off their feet, you know, because what we see in, in, in that is perfection. And perfection, whether we like it or not, is something that which we as a species have always tried to aspire to, whether it's art or science or anything else. We, we always have a goal. We are driven. We're, we're an ambitious organism. We've, you know, we've got to the moon. You know, we've done yeah. remarkable things in, in, in creative arts. Um, and, and that striving for perfection, you know, we're always humble when we just go outside. And, you know, I mean, I, I was out the other day and I just looked at a bird's nest with four eggs in. And I sort of thought, well, if I was tasked with having to make that, you know, can you imagine? I mean, it would be a task for Grimm's fairy tale, you know, princess. You just can't, couldn't make a bird's nest in in a hundred years, and yet they've done it in in the space of a few days. So it's easy for us to marvel at the, at the perfection of nature, and I think that gives us a great release. And and you know. And, and at the moment, with spring bursting with such fortitude in, you know, in this fine weather that we're certainly having in the south uh, of the UK, um, it's also reassuring. You know, we've got all of this, yeah. uh, you know, death and destruction around us. We go outside and there's flowers coming, the birds are singing, and everything's happening. And it's life's tenacity is just, you know, prospering and it's exploding. And there's a real feel good reaction to that and from that i mean we've started running something called the self-isolating bird club and it's proved to be enormously popular with people looking at webcams of of birds nests and activities all over the world how uh, there's some ospreys down on the south coast which might breed for the first time in 200 years there's a female oh, there nest goodness. building at the moment waiting for a male to turn up and, and you know it, the ornithological nation's eyes are glued on this um, and, yeah. and everyone's willing for it to happen. And, and also it's been community building. So a lot of yeah. people have had a, a bit more time on their hands to indulge their interest, might be engaging with nature. And then because they've feel, felt so positive about that, they have felt compelled to share the way that they feel. And so we've seen enormous you know, positive sharing on social media for people who have an interest in the natural world. And, and even if they're finding it in their window box or their garden or just that hour of daily exercise that they're taking, um, they are boosting their exuberance by being able to share that with a like-minded community. So there is amongst all of the darkness, a real, you know, a real joy at the moment when people are connecting with nature. And that's, from my point of view, is fantastic. I totally agree. At the risk of me sounding terribly hippified, is there a need for us to almost step away from this idea of being at the top of the food chain and therefore holding dominion over everything and moving into more of an attitude of partnership with the natural world? Is that where we need to move to? Yeah, very much so. Um, and I, I th yes, I mean, it's not really hippified. There's a good, there's a good you know, sound biological reason for that. I mean, look, the, the idea that we hold dominion over every other form of life, it's there to serve us, has been brutally exposed by this virus. Now you can, there's, you know, you can argue about how alive viruses are, but they're competitive, they reproduce, they seek advantage. Um, they're essentially living things. And at the moment, that living thing is holding dominion over us. And that's one of the cruel lessons that we are being taught here. We are not separate from nature. We are very much a part of it. And when we abuse it, 
you know, we make ourselves vulnerable. I mean, if you think about the origins of this virus, it should never have been able to find its way into our species. Mm -hmm. Our species are not meant to be trafficking animals from all over the world, mixing them together in live market where they share pathogens which mutate, which then can get in, in, into the human species. Um, we are, we, 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 you know, bats are not essentially on our menu. We didn't ought to be eating those sorts of animals. Um, it would have only happened very, very rarely in, in, in any natural situation. So, yeah, we've been cruelly exposed for, 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 for forgetting that we are very much part and parcel of that natural world. And sometimes I think that's the, the more important thing to remember. You will hear people, myself included, saying we're dependent on ecosystem services earth for all of our food that grows from the soil, where the bacteria in the soil are, are what give it, it, it its ability to produce that food. Um, we're dependent on, you know, the timber from the forest for our building materials. We're depending on the fish from the sea. I could go on. Um, but the word dependent is where I want to sort of, you know, challenge myself because it's not that we are dependent, it's that we're a part of it. And if we forget we were part of it, then then this is what happens, basically. That's huge. And that's, that's kind of what I was alluding to when I was tongue in cheek, referring to, to, to hippie fied stuff. I, I follow very much kind of medicine shamanic path. So that's my deflection when people try to take the mickey a little bit. But it's I know, but oldest... you said hippie. You, you said hippie, but you got a punk rock haircut. So absolutely. You know, I, I straddle it beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, that's, that's really important. I think both of those genres had important things to say. They, they weren't very Precisely. compatible at the time. There no, was a, no. A punk, punk really rebelled against the hippie ethos, but a, a quite yep. a lot of us old punks have actually embraced quite a lot of it in, in later life. I mean, I, I remember the bleach I, laptop, Chris. I remember. <laughs> I know, but what, two nights ago, I spent the whole evening into the early hours watching Bob Dylan videos on YouTube, you know, and could, one could not have been more hippie than Bob at that point in time. Good man, good man. But the, the point I was going to go to is, you know, the old people have been saying for so long, we're all related. And we've just chosen to forget or chosen to ignore. And, yeah, and I guess... Disconnected. And, and, and I think one of the reasons is that you know, I, well, one of the ways to, 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 to overcome that is through our food, you know. Yeah. Every, we are, we obviously, everything that we eat has, has grown on, on this planet. Uh, some of it has been farmed and some of it has been harvested from, from, from the wild. But many people actually uh, acquire their food now with no idea where it came, well, what it is, where it came from, um, whether it's good or bad for them, um, and, and the environmental implications of its growth or harvesting. Um, Absolutely. And so I often think that one of the ways to reconnect us with nature is through our food. And it, it's unusual you know, it, it, in, in some ways that the way our culture in the UK has got into that state, because in some parts of France where I've spent time living, um, people are very connected to their food. And, you know, yeah. and they, they take great pride in knowing where it's come from, how nutritious it is, how it was produced. And if things, you know, on one occasion, I remember driving through a village in France and that there were a, a, a large collection of people obviously demonstrating in the village. And I stopped and asked them and it was because the local um, winery had decided that they were going to spray insecticide and herbicide underneath the vines. And they didn't want that. So they were going to boycott all of the wines, bearing in mind that the, that the winery was just around the corner from where the demonstration was. Um, the, the winery's uh, reason for doing so is that they had secured a bigger deal and they wanted to sell to supermarkets and that, that was a prerequisite of the supermarkets requirements. So it was resolved by the, the winery um, basically spraying half the crop and not the other half and the other half was what was sold to the local villages because they didn't want it to be sprayed and so and all the people that were involved in the process um protest um were how can i phrase it older than me so this was like my parents and i just i looked at these french people and i thought my mum and dad would never take to the streets if the if, if they thought that the local farmer was doing something unspeakable all they do is they go to the supermarket and they look at what the price is and they put it in the trolley 
So there are yeah. peoples across the world who are better connected to their food and, the, and their health as a result of that. Yeah. But I think largely in the UK, you know, we have a supermarket monopoly and they basically tempt us through the door on price, not on quality, and certainly yeah. not on us being able to support you know, British farming interest and therefore be able to work with British farmers to improve the way that they farm in terms of it being sustainable and environmentally friendly. So we we need to address that, I think, as well. And that's something, you know, but the supermarkets need to be more accountable. We need better food labelling. Again, yeah. even in the United States, I noticed that when you buy food, there's a lot more information about what in it, uh, what's potentially harmful, what's definitely beneficial and also where it's come from and very often when you pick up anything in the supermarket in the UK you've got no idea at all the labeling is very poor but we can't effectively make a choice and I think that we can only make improvements if we are able to make best informed decisions and then make the right choice so there's all sorts of things food labeling happens to be a bugbear of mine I, I you know and, and not supporting British farmers is another yeah, I'm with you. And that takes a mindset shift as well, isn't it? it? Doesn't it? To get us to the point where we actually want to look at labels and to get us to the point where we are more willing to look honestly at where our food has come from. I mean, even things like the amount of people I know who will not eat something that's come from, a, from an animal if it still looks like the animal. So that, you know, they'll only eat fish if it's filleted and they can't see that it has a head and eyes. They don't, they don't want to think about the fact that that chicken fillet has come from a living being. We need a mindset yeah. shift too, don't we? If we're going to eat meat, for instance, or dairy products, surely we need to be willing to accept that's come from an animal. And at the very least, take an interest in the husbandry of that animal. Yeah, no, a few years ago, I... I, I raised a degree of controversy by suggesting that rather like uh, tobacco uh, uh, packaging, that, that meat packaging should have photographs on the packaging of the conditions that the animals were kept in. And I think, yeah. that, frankly, that would change conditions that animals are kept in overnight. Because although yeah. we have you know, regulations in the UK and in Europe, which are better than many parts of the world, they're still not satisfactory when it comes to the way that we keep many of our animals and how and equally how are we meant to encourage those farmers who are doing really good things if we can't see which is their produce and which isn't and i know yeah. a number of good or organic farmers who who take a great deal of pride in i mean you know setting their own standards way above those which are set by government and, and food agencies um, but their food is mixed into the food chain and essentially they're dragged down by the industrial farmers um, so you know let's face it I, I know a fellow henry edmonds and his you know I, i'm vegan i don't eat meat but yeah, me he, he farms meat and and dairy products and his farm is very beautiful and his animals have an, the best quality of life that they can have um, and 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 if that was on the label i'm sure people would go for his meat before they would go to some ghastly stuff that's coming out of europe where their conditions have been truly horrendous and we know that we have to eat less meat that's probably why you and i are, one of the reasons why you and i are vegan but we also know that we have to go through a transition we have to lead people through that eating less and less meat we have to make sure that our farmers have somewhere to go in the future we don't want to bankrupt every you know dairy farmer and, and beef stock farmer that we have very often like henry's farm they are great places for biodiversity but if we're going to ask the public to follow us on the journey that we're trying to make, we have to give them the opportunities to see why they should. So I say put pictures of Henry's farm on his meat and people would buy that over some of the other ghastly stuff that it gets mixed in with. You know? I think that's a tremendous idea. I can't see them going for it. But then, you know, at one point, the tobacco manufacturers wouldn't have gone for it either. So it takes a sea change. So all of this the nature, looking at what we eat, looking at the, our outlook, of course, that all ties into our mental health. What are you doing, Chris, to, to keep yourself kind of positive through, through all of this? Um, well, rather unusually, I, I, I've probably been in training for self-isolation for, for years because I, I found it necessary to, to you know, find um, comfort in my own company a, a long time ago. I was diagnosed with Asperger's in my 40s, mm -hmm. but long before that, I, I'd found respite from the problems, the social problems that that condition can, can give rise to, by just mm -hmm. basically being comfortable 
on my own. Um, so I can be solitary, but never lonely. Um, and so when I finish work where I necessarily have to socialize, typically I come home and I don't go out. I mean, I'll go out in the woods and, uh, and, and I'll go out and f in, 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 into nature, but I, I'm not a, a, a social person. So I, I'm not craving company. I'm not craving, you know, going out to restaurants and pubs and, and all those things that people do. So um, I, su I suppose, you know, my family have joked and said, you know, this is perversely a, a dream come true for you. That you can <laughs> stay out seven days a week and, and just, and I'm here with my stepdaughter and, and obviously she's grown up with me. So we get on really well and there's no conflict whatsoever. And, um, and, but, um, you know, I still, there are, other things i mean i found myself in the last oh, i don't know two weeks on occasion you know with sort of mild depression i suppose feeling fed up let's not call it depression yeah. and i tried to critically analyze why that is i think that's important you know it's learning to know oneself and to be able to measure you know why you are feeling a particular way because if you don't you know if you don't enable yourself to identify those the, the, the clues that are there for you you can't address it so I, I've become more adept at, at sort of thinking, oh, yeah, I've got out the wrong side of the bed today. What's that about then? And then I'll, I'll work yeah. through uh, the, the things that are impacting on my life at that point. And I'll, and I'll find out what it is. And that gives me the capacity to address it. So I think that without, you know, suggesting that we become amateur um, psychiatrist or psychotherapist, we, you know, being able to understand how we feel and what makes us feel the way that we feel can be an enormous asset, particularly in times like this, when reaching out for help when it comes to mental health issues is even more difficult than it normally is. Yeah. Um, so I think that's uh, uh, an asset. And, and the other thing is that when I was a child, I always imagined that I spent most of my time out in the fields and the woods, as my mum would say, um, because it was there that the things that fascinated me most lived. Um, but what I've come to realize now is that certainly through my teens and twenties, another reason that I spent so much time there was to, was to soak up that nature as a, a very clear uh, form of respite from the sort of attrition that I was getting in, in other parts of my other, other parts of my life. And ultimately, you see, if you, if you think about it in a very ideal, well, a very simplistic way, um, when it comes to the autism, when I'm here on my own, I'm normal you know, because there's nothing to contrast myself with. And therefore I can lapse into being more me than I am me when I'm mixing with other people where I have to regulate some of my behaviors to make them socially um, acceptable. Um, because society hasn't yet got to the point where it accepts some of the ways that people like myself think, uh, verbalize or not, um, and, and, and behave. So in, in, in a way, it's always been relaxing to come back to a space which I, I control um, my house, parts of my house, I share it with Megan, parts of my house, and, 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 and there I can be more me, probably, than, than anywhere else. So I can sort of let my guard down and I can probably be more comfortable and more relaxed. Yeah, there are a lot of tips there that the, that regardless of whether whether or not people are on the spectrum somewhere could could make use of I mean, in a lot of the people that i coach i talk about the importance of that rather than just accepting well i'm depressed okay why are you depressed what's triggered of that which is which aspect of you is it that that is upset that needs some attention what do they need how can you get beyond that and i think that's that's a sea change for us in the west as well so I've long said that we are largely addicted to drama and the endorphins that that fires. Whereas if we could stop just going straight into that, I'm depressed, I need help, that it sounds terrible, but that victim mentality and started doing a bit more of the stuff that so many of us dismiss as navel gazing, we would be able to get back to a place of balance far more swiftly. It's wanting to though, isn't yeah. it? It is wanting to and finding a reason to, I, I think. And, and the, I suppose what I fear, having been very seriously depressed on a number of occasions, is mm. that that collapse to that point is too quick to be able to grab the sides. Um, yeah. And so well, the last time that I was very seriously depressed, I did reach out for the first time, in fact, and, and I had a course of 
psychotherapy. I found it at the time, I wasn't convinced that it was doing me any good. Retrospectively, I recognized it, it, it had done me enormous good. Yeah. Um, but again, people like myself, it's not natural for us to reach out to other people because mm -hmm. we empathize in different ways. Um, you know, I, yeah. I don't seek sympathy. Sympathy is of no good to me. If I fall over and I cut my hand, it's no good someone saying, oh, I'm sorry about that. What I really need is some, you know, antiseptic and, 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 and a medical <laughs> practitioner to put some stitches in it. It's, sympathy's not, I mean, this is in my black and white world of Asperger's, you know. No, I got it. The, the, yeah, that, that it's not going to achieve anything. Therefore, it's valueless. Therefore, I'm not very good at giving it either. I have to contemplate. You know, I have to consciously think about how I manifest my uh, presentation of sympathy to other people. So yeah. anyway, I've digressed a little bit. Reaching out is not something that you know, comes naturally to us, and I think that's one of the reasons why people with Asperger's are more prone to uh, dangerous um, fits of depression mm -hmm. um, because we, we, you know, we we basically just try and deal with it ourselves. And I'd got to a point yeah. where in my life, where there was so much baggage that I, I, I recognized that I couldn't deal with it myself. And I, and I understood I was genuinely worried that even if I got through this spate of depression, what would happen the next time? And I almost yeah. was, when I was going through the psychotherapy, I was concentrating as much as I could to see how it was working so that I was building a toolkit, if it was like, which I might be able to self apply in, yeah. in, in the future. So if it didn't get to that instantaneously critical collapse, then if it was going to be a gradual process, I could think, okay, I understand what's going on. I can identify that personally. And I've got a toolkit, which I've built with the help of a professional um, to, to work my way into a position of security and safety. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and that was my, my method. I, I mean, I, I've got to say that it's probably only been partially tested um, but is that I, I like to think that, that the reason I've only had to partially test it is because the preparations have worked and I, I, I haven't got to that, to that, you know, very, very dark place that I, I've been in a few times before. Well, arguably, if you can spot the signs, you can do something about it. So again, you know, I don't have Asperger's, but I've been in very, very dark places. That's kind of part of my backstory that I use for helping other people. Um, I smiled when you spoke about sympathy because I always remember one of my old medicine teachers saying that um, sympathy is what you find between shit and syphilis in the dictionary. <laughs> was, yeah, <laughs> kind of makes sense. Yeah. So what, what would be, if you were going to give some quick tips or quick bits of advice for people sitting at home who have been struggling with this, what, what would they be, Chris? Well, firstly, um, pay attention to those people who are around you. And, and look at them a little bit more critically. And if they are a bit angsty and edgy, and if they're a bit angry, um, or if they are manifestly down and depressed, you know, analyze that, that behavior. Uh, um, because one of the things that I will say is that, you know, when I've been depressed, the people that have been around me have desperately wanted to help me, but they haven't been equipped to do that. So they have the, you know, the, the 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 desire to do that that you know the genuine love i mean everyone wants to help their friends and their family when they're in a, a time of crisis particularly mental health crisis but that doesn't mean that we're all trained to do that and so i think the thing to do is you if you can identify those signs in someone that you know and if you recognize that they're reaching a critical point at that point you must help them reach out to a healthcare professional because it's likely that they're going to get far greater success there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because, and, and, and this comes down to, you know, things like, uh, particularly, you know, men, men are not very good at talking about being depressed. You know, they'll, someone will say to them, how are you? And they'll go, yeah, I'm fine. But the person you ask actually knows they're not fine. You know, yeah. and they, and they go, oh, okay, then, you know, but you know, they're not fine. So stop pretending that they are. Stop yeah. letting them, you know, just brush it off. And you take control at that point. Mm. If you love that person and you care for that person, you want to look after them, you need to take control at that point because they are, may not be able to do that themselves. And as difficult as it is, if you can put them in a position where they'll accept professional help, then I think that they'll be far safer there. Um, I'm not saying that a shoulder to cry on won't work at some point for some people, 
but when things get really, really tough, you need trained people to intercede um, and, 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 and make sure that there's a path out of it. And, and that's something that needs to be recognized. So the first thing would be pay strict attention to those people around you, be critically, look, look at them critically. And if you think they're in real trouble, don't wait to act, act straight away, because it's not gonna get better, it's only gonna get worse. So that would be the thing. And then again, yourself, I mean, I think it's identify those things where you can turn yourself around. Um, and it might be, it, there's a plethora of, of ways that people cheer, cheer, cheer themselves up if they're a bit off colour mentally. Um, and just make sure you have access to those sorts of things. And it could be music, it could be exercise. I mean, people you know, can be anything, can't it, really? So just focus upon that. And my partner, Charlotte, um, has been um, drilling me over the last week and, and saying, you know, I, one of the things that I like to do, but I never afford myself time to do is to paint. Um, it's a craving. I go on about it. I go to art galleries the whole time. I buy paint and paint brushes and then I never get time to do it. And she's been berating me for the last week um, for, for not going out into my garage sort of converted studio and getting on with some painting because she knows full well that if I have done something which is just for me, uh, there's no profit in it i'm not selling my paintings or anything it's not anything to do with my work it's entirely a, a, a sort of a, 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 a pleasurable distraction then she knows that i will be less resentful of all of the other things the millions of emails that i've been answering every day and solving this problem that problem and everything for someone else so that's been her her method you know that's her her, her way of you know providing support is by saying stop doing those emails now and get out into that studio and just splash some paint around, make a mess on a piece of canvas, you know? So again, encourage people to do those sorts of things. And very often it's, it, it can be new things. You know, if you've got young people, um, you know, particularly if they're, you know, uh, maybe teenagers or slightly older, um, set them, a, you know, try and get them to accept a challenge, which is entirely new to them. You know, if they're too comfortable, they're just going to sit down and watch Netflix. But if they've got something mentally where they can stimulate themselves because it's exciting and new, if you can afford, you know, find a means of, uh, of, of them having access to that, that can be really good. And the same for, uh, you know, I have to say, we know full well that, you know, the, the scientifically it's been measured that if in uh, people uh, in, in middle age, if they take up something which they have no aptitude to do at all, so the most difficult thing cognitively for them to try and do, this has been shown to reduce the onset of neurodegenerative diseases. So behind me here, wow. you can just see it. There's a piano. Yep. <laughs> I can't play it. I've got no <laughs> musical ability at all. But Charlotte, my partner, bought me this piano because she said, I don't want you getting senile. You've got to do something which you have just <laughs> impossible. And so it was either learn Chinese or play the piano. And I opted for the piano. <laughs> I think at this point in time, I'm probably better at Chinese than I am at playing the piano, unfortunately. <laughs> but those sorts of things, this is the time. You know, we've got time on our hands. Let's you know, rise yeah. to those challenges, you know, because they can be enormously cognitively stimulating. And that, again, yeah. I think in terms of brain activity, um, brain chemistry, is, it can be very positive. Huge. Chris, thank you so much. It has been a pleasure. I could talk to you all afternoon. So thank you so, so much for coming on. If people want to get in touch with you afterwards or look you up, where are the best places for them to find you? Well, we're running the South Isolating Bird Club. So if you want to escape into some nature and, and share your passion for that with, with others in a, a like-minded community, that's on Twitter and on Facebook. And then my own Facebook page is supporting that at the moment as well. And then every morning between um, 9 and 9.30, my stepdaughter and I are producing live broadcasts, which we're putting out on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. Um, and again, that's uh, about that community of people. So we've got sort of guests coming in and we're doing it all with our mobile phones, but it's getting increasingly slickish. Um, and, yeah. um, and, and so if you have a passion for that. And then, as I said, lastly, if you, know, if you just fancy a sort of an afternoon off and you know spring watch hasn't started yet um then do check out the sort of uh the, some of those webcams with birds on and the, the birds of paul harbour paul harbour ospreys are um are, is well worth a look at the moment it's a beautiful camera a beautiful bird and you can sit and watch that for 10 minutes and you know get your mind out of some of the mess that's going on elsewhere 
Thank you so much. Here's hoping this does create a sea change for us and that we move to a better place. And I look forward to, well, seeing how it all unfolds. So thanks again, Chris, and take care. You're most welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.